Well, good morning. It's good to be with you here again in, in uh, Crane, Texas. If you were here last week, uh, um, I, I'm one of those people who says I like being in Crane, Texas. So uh, um, it's good to be here with you. And it's good to sing songs like Glorious Day and I'll Fly Away. I think the last time I sung either of those two, I was probably at a tent revival. And it might have been decades ago. Uh, so uh, it's fun to uh, hear those old ones again that somehow I know all the words to still. Um, this morning our text is from Acts 26, uh, beginning at verse 16, but I want to give you a, a couple of words uh, to give you a little bit of context. Um, it would be difficult to jump in at this uh, chapter 26 without a little bit of context of the previous chapters. And so I'll give you a brief rundown of that uh, first. Uh, Paul finds himself, this is the Apostle Paul, he finds himself in Jerusalem and um, he's attacked by really the same group of folks that have been following him uh, throughout his entire ministry. They show up regardless to where he is. And while he is in Jerusalem, uh, these group of folks who are trying to stop his progress, uh, stop his message, um, uh, they attack him. There is a mob uh, type uh, situation that develops. And uh, the, the focus of the Roman authorities to make sure that they are always keeping the peace, uh, they jump in immediately. Uh, it's discovered during this time, during this, this mob action against Paul, it's discovered that Paul is a Roman citizen. That little bit of information comes out. And Paul then uh, when this disturbance occurs, uh, he's taken into custody by the Roman authorities. And if you kind of read uh, all of the book of Acts and you watch how the Roman authorities interact with Paul, uh, you kind of realize that it seems like they're trying to protect him as much as anything else. Uh, and we'll see that today, different examples as we look at our passage today where the Roman authorities really, uh, where in most of the New Testament they seem to be the bad guys, and especially from the Jewish perspective, uh, but Paul in, in this situation, um, uh, uh, they seem to be fairly balanced, and they're trying at least to do the right judicious thing here. Uh, they step in and they take Paul into custody. He's not arrested, um, but they do take him into custody, and it almost provides protection from the mob as much as anything. There's a trial of sorts that occurs, and it's between uh, the Roman tribune, uh, uh, this, this officer of Rome, uh, and, and he's hearing uh, testimony from Paul. He's hearing testimony from uh, this group that is called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was this group of men originally under Moses that Moses uh, uh, created this group. Uh, they were the elders. They made decisions on different judicial matters, uh, some religious, not all religious uh, matters. But at this time in uh, history, uh, these, the Sanhedrin is composed of the high priests, uh, it's composed of scribes and, and uh, other elders uh, within the religion. And so this continues to go on back and forth. There's no resolution. The Roman tribune uh, determines uh, that this needs to go to a higher authority. And so Paul is then taken to Caesarea where he stands before the governor, Felix. And uh, at this time, another trial of sorts takes place, and it's during that time and that trial before Felix that Paul appeals to Caesar. Uh, Paul realizes in this situation uh, the, the, the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin uh, members have come to Caesarea to once again argue against Paul, uh, claiming he deserves death. They want to take him back to Jerusalem and supposedly try him there. Paul doesn't believe that for a moment. Uh, he realizes that he'll probably be killed uh, going back to Jerusalem. And he realizes that the Roman authorities don't seem to know how to handle the situation. 
It's kind of a political situation. And if they do the wrong thing, they could have an uprising on their hands, which they don't want, and they don't want Rome hearing about that either. And so they're kind of immobilized. And before Felix, uh, Paul at this point uh, requests an appeal, and his appeal goes directly to Rome, to the emperor, uh, to Caesar. And um, there's a period of time then during this indecision. It, It lasts about two years. Paul is sitting waiting for a decision He's waiting to be transported back to Rome. And while he's awaiting this, uh, Felix then uh, passes from being governor, and uh, his successor uh, is a man named Porcius Festus. And so Porcius Festus gets into the position as governor in Caesarea, and immediately he's confronted with, you've got a prisoner, Paul, he's been here for two-plus years, and we don't have a decision on him. He's appealed to Caesar. We need to figure out what to do with him. We need to make a judgment, send him to Rome. And King Agrippa comes in uh, to welcome uh, Festus uh, into his new position. And this is how Festus introduces Paul and to many others um, at that point. In chapter 25, starting at verse 24, he says, He says, King Agrippa, this is Festus speaking, and all who are present with us, you see this man, being Paul, about whom the whole Jewish nation petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him but I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. And then, almost humorously, Festus says, For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. No Roman can find any reason why Paul should be put to death. And our text this morning opens with Paul defending himself before King Agrippa and Festus and the others. And Paul starts out by describing himself as a devout Jew who had earnestly worked against Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus' message. And then Paul contrasts his former life against his conversion on the road to Damascus. And then Paul goes on further then uh, to give us a brief outline of almost all apostolic sermons. Uh, Anyone who is an apostle, when we read through their sermons, they almost all take the same form, and we'll see that here in a moment. That's our introduction So let's bow in prayer before we go into our text this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to to stand before your throne, to sing your praises and the praises of the work that you have done through the work of your son Jesus this morning. And we ask, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit to us this moment that we would receive the truths that you have held for us, that as we dive into your scriptures, that we will commit these things not only to our minds, but to our hearts, and therefore to our lives. Guide us, Father, now uh, to your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, starting at verse 16 in chapter 26, This is Paul, and he's backing up. He's giving his introduction into his conversion. 
He's already talked about uh, being a devout Jew. And now in verse 16, he begins to talk about uh, his conversion here. And he says, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul is recounting his conversion and his appointment, his assignment here uh, on the road to Damascus and in, in his conversion uh, story. And he's talking about this commission that he has received from Jesus. He's, he's told to stand on his feet for this purpose, and he is being appointed as two things. First, Jesus appoints Paul as a servant. This is an element of being an apostle. And Paul takes this on to heart throughout all of Paul's writings in the New Testament uh, going forward. Paul references himself as a servant. In Romans 1, he calls himself a servant and an apostle called by Christ. And in, in, in the road or in Damascus, there was a man named Ananias. And Ananias is told, uh, if uh, remember the story, Paul's heading to Damascus. He's going to go persecute uh, Christians. And, and on that way, um, he's struck from, uh, to the ground and, and he can't see. He's taken on into Damascus as, as the Lord has told him to do. And Ananias then receives a vision. Ananias is a believer. Ananias is told, go to Paul, lay your hands on him so that he may see. And Ananias questions this vision. And he says, well, I, I, I'm not so sure I should do this. I, I know who Paul is. Uh, he'll more than likely kill me uh, the moment that he can see me. And um, in Acts 9, 15, in this vision, the Lord then tells Ananias that Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry out my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Paul uh, has unbelievable credentials uh, going forward. He has been sent uh, by Christ. And in this first uh, category here uh, is to be a servant. The second area that Paul is designated for as an apostle, as all apostles are, um, he is a witness. We, what, what is a witness? A witness is someone who was there who saw the events take place. So when you go into a courtroom, when we bring up the witnesses, we bring them up and say, well, tell us what you saw. What did you see? What happened in these events? That's the primary um, responsibility of any apostle. When we look at the requirements to be an apostle in Acts 1, uh, verse 21 through 22, we see that it is a man that had been with Jesus during the whole time of Jesus' public ministry. Now, we know about times about Jesus when he wasn't in public ministry, um, but his public ministry would be the time from his baptism all through his life until, the, uh, uh, until his death and his resurrection and then his ascension. That would be his public ministry. And so the requirement of an apostle is one to have been with Jesus during that entire time. And then for the purpose that that apostle would be a witness to specifically the resurrection. And the reason why the resurrection is so important is because God shows truth. God shows that he has ordained things. God shows whose side he is on when he accompanies a miracle with an event. 
God the Father is showing in Jesus Christ's resurrection the ordination, the truth, the validity of Christ and everything he did and said. It is a miracle to accompany and say, yes, that's, I'm ordaining this. I made it actually happen. And so this is the ministry of the apostles. It is to be a witness to the resurrection. And as you read through the Old Testament and continue to read, you'll notice that all of these guys, all of these apostles, that's what they do. They're always talking about the resurrection once it happens. They never get up and just talk about, here's how to live a better life. They never talk about any other kind of nostalgic type of things that people often talk about in Bible studies or in sermons. They're talking about the resurrection and its importance. They are witnesses to that. So you may be thinking in your mind, well, Paul wasn't around during that time. How is it that he fits under this definition of being an apostle? And it's where we read uh, in verse 16 that we get a bit of a glimpse of this, and we see it throughout Paul's ministry as he explains his uh, conversion at different times. But Jesus is saying to Paul in verse 16, Rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you a servant and a witness. And he says, now, here's what you're a witness to. The same thing all the other apostles were. He says, a witness to the things in which you have seen me. So he says, Paul is a witness to Christ's public ministry because of the things that have occurred that Paul can witness that have happened because of Jesus' ministry. So Jesus says, you're, a, you're an apostle in a different kind of way. You're an apostle because you have seen the reaction of the things that have taken place out of Christ's life. And he says, and then, and then secondly, he says, and to those in which I will appear to you. So Paul is going to get some other instruction, at least. We know going forward. He didn't spend those three years of public ministry time with Jesus on this earth. Jesus had lived, died, resurrected, and ascended before even Paul comes onto the scene. But Paul is going to get additional training. Jesus is going to reveal things to him specifically. He's going to go on a tutorship. It's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's not going to be the 12 with Jesus. And so Paul, this is how he comes into his apostleship and is able still to be in that definition of what an apostle does, one who is a servant and one who is a witness to the resurrection. He gives us his purpose in verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness. That's the first thing you're going to do, Paul. That's your purpose and what you're here for to open people's eyes from darkness to lie, lie, light. From untruth, from ununderstanding to knowledge, to truth. And from the power of Satan, we're going to turn you from Satan to God for the purpose that they would receive forgiveness of their sins and a place among those who are sanctified, those who are being made holy. A person who's outside of the family but now is in the family. And a person that's outside of the family, but a person in the family, in God's family, who is being made holy by the Holy Spirit. Not your own actions. You're not making yourself holy. You can kind of participate in it, and obediently you should, but the Holy Spirit's the one who's doing it through the work of Christ, by the Father. And Paul continues his defense then in verse 19, and he gives us this basic outline of the apostolic sermon, the sermon that all the apostles give in one form or another. And in verse 19, he says, Therefore, Paul, still in this courtroom, still giving his 
defense. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He says, what, what Jesus told me, I wasn't disobedient to. I've done it, and I am doing it. That's why these people are attacking me. He says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but in verse 20, but declared first to those in Damascus. Paul had been converted, and within days, he's preaching the gospel message as best he knows and as best he can. He doesn't wait. He doesn't say, well, I need to go to Jerusalem and shore this up and get some answers, and, 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 then, we'll, and then we'll go. He begins immediately in his ministry. Then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region. He says, I, I did go to Jerusalem. And then throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles. And this is what he said, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Repent. We hear that a lot, especially in, in, in certain Christian circles. We've probably all heard various definitions of, of what repentance means. Repent means to change your mind. Not just, not this one, but this one. It does mean that, not this one, but this one. But it means that your mind is so changed that, that it's a different mind. It sees things differently. It sees the world differently. It's so that your views, listen to this list, your views of things are different, your values are different, your goals and the ways of your life are changed. One's whole life is lived completely differently. That's what repentance is. Your mind, your judgment, your will, what you desire to do, your affections, those things that attract you, your behavior, your lifestyle, your motives and plans, they're all involved. Every part of you that controls you when you are sinning. Every part that works together, your emotions, your mind, your body in certain ways, when you commit a sin, all of those things are changed and they stop being focused and the energy moving towards you sinning and they move towards you not. That's repentance. And that's the target of repentance, all of those things. It's a complete surrender. Complete. There's no holding back of any one area. And Paul says here it's followed by, it's followed by you starting a new life at that point. There, there's a radical difference. In verse 21, he says, it's that preaching, that message right there, he says to King Agrippa and those in attendance. He says, it's for this reason that the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. First thing Paul does here is he, he ordains himself. He gives his own authority. He shows how, how he is able to even make these statements, these truth claims from God. He says, my, my help comes from God. If God wasn't supporting what I'm saying... I wouldn't be receiving any help from him. So the things that I say are ordained by God. That's why he is allowing them and helping me in the ways that he has to continue my apostleship, to continue my ministry. I couldn't help but think of 1 Peter 1 when I heard this, especially when I was reading this this week. And, and when he's talking about, I'm not saying anything that the prophets and Moses didn't already say. 
It's all connected. It's all the same. And Peter does this great job of explaining this in chapter 1 and verse 10. Peter talks about salvation and repentance and Christ's work in that on our behalf. And he says, <clears throat> this message was something that the prophets didn't fully understand. That's what Peter is saying about, about salvation. He says, the prophets didn't fully understand what was going on. And he says, though they wrote about it, they had many questions as to what it all could mean. They wondered what the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about. So as you can imagine, an Old Testament prophet, these guys writing down, writing down the prophecies, writing down these scriptures that are, are our Old Testament. And as they're writing them down, Peter's saying, they didn't even completely understand what they were writing. They were writing what the Holy Spirit was giving them to write. Now, it was influenced by their personalities, no doubt, their writing styles and those things that made them who they were. But the message and the words and the meaning was from God, specifically the Holy Spirit. And he says, they were writing these things down in verse 11 of that, that first uh, chapter they wondered what the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about. For he told them to write them down, these events, since then, these events which have happened. That's what Peter is saying. God was telling the Old Testament prophets in the back, historically, to write these things down. And he says, now these things have come to pass. That's what Peter is saying and Paul is saying, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just telling you the fulfillment of what has happened. And they said they, they spoke about what would happen to the Christ. They spoke about his suffering, but his great glory afterwards. Here are the prophets talking about the resurrection as well and Christ's ascension into heaven. He says, and they wondered when and to whom all this would happen. These Old Testament prophets... They're, they're wondering, they're writing these things down, they're saying, who is a Christ? I don't know, is he here with us right now? And, and when is this all going to happen? They were wondering as they were writing these things, Isaiah and the others. And in verse 12, then he says, they were finally told that these things would not occur during their lifetime, but long years after. The prophets ended up knowing this isn't happening right now, it's happening in the future. This is prophecy in the true sense of, or in the one definition of prophecy being, I'm telling you about something right now that's going to happen in the future. And I don't know all the details, but we'll know them. They were finally told that these things would not occur during their lifetime, but long years later, and now at last this good news has been plainly announced to all of us. That's what Peter says. We, we have it in completion. We understand who the Messiah is. We understand who the Christ is. It's Jesus. And he came and he lived this perfect life on our behalf. And he died as well on our behalf. And he was raised up on our behalf. And he's ascended into glory and sits at the right hand of God where you as a believer will sit with him one day. He said this is the message that the prophets were talking about and Paul says, this is the reason why I'm standing here on trial. Because of this hope that I've presented. In verse 23, he continues on, Paul does, with his message, being that, again, just as uh, Paul has, uh, or Peter has spoke. In verse 26, 23, he says, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So Paul summarizes, and maybe Luke didn't, maybe Luke didn't give us every single word of that sermon or that defense that was given by Paul here, but he sure gives us the bullet points. Jesus Christ came to earth and he suffered. He suffered not just in the same ways that we suffered, although he did that, but it starts with his suffering and the fact that he gave up his rightful place in heaven 
at the right hand of God, on the throne of God, and became a part of the creation. It's an absurd notion. The idea that the one in Genesis 1-1, and, and as we're told in the New Testament, spoke everything into creation. It's, it's by his words that he created all things. And, and this is the one that will now come from that position of being able to create nothing out of his words, now comes to heaven, now comes to earth from heaven. It's a ridiculous notion. His suffering began just in the idea of what he would do on our behalf. So he becomes a part of the creation. He lives this perfect lifestyle. It allows him to become a sacrifice on our behalf, an unblemished, perfect sacrifice. But he also lives that perfect life, as Paul tells us, in order that he may obtain a righteousness unto himself. You see, he was righteous already, wasn't he? He was God. It's the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus Christ. He's righteous. He goes through the exercise to gain it, though, and to earn it to himself, even though he already had it. And then he dies, the part that we are most familiar with, in our place. The death you deserve because of your own sins. He took your place. He was your substitution. And then he rises up. God raises him from the dead. And he's raised unto glory at his ascension. That's the life of Christ, that he would come and that he would suffer. That's what we mean in his suffering. And then he would be raised from death to life. Luke here in Acts tells us that God raised him up. He was the first to rise. You say, well, I, what about Lazarus? Lazarus rose from the dead as well. Um, so not quite sure I understand what that means, but Christ is the first to rise up in the family, to rise up from spiritual death into spiritual life. And we too follow in that pattern as believers. It's one of the great things about the Baptists and, 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 and the baptismal uh, I, uh, uh, verses that are used um, during, uh, during baptism. It's this idea of being dead and being raised up. And we are raised up after him, in succession of him, into our spiritual life. Finally, Paul says, I'm bringing this message. I was definitely the apostle to the Gentiles, but in his original charter, you realize he, he was told also that you're going you're to give your message as well to the Jewish people. That's not going to drop off. So we've covered all of humanity, either Jewish or not Jewish. So Jewish and Gentile, he's covered everyone, all mankind receive him the same way. And that's Paul's responsibility. And he closes his sermon at least, or his uh, argument, his defense at this point. Repent, believe in faith, and do those things that are in accord with your repentance and your life. And if you need any verification or support of that, it's the resurrection. That's the miracle that Jesus or that God puts on top of it all and says there. Paul even says it later. If there's no resurrection, then the rest of it doesn't make any difference. Go do something different on Sunday morning. Go dedicate your life to some other cause. Because if it wasn't for the resurrection, nothing else matters. Repent and believe. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for these mysteries that you have preserved for us through history. Not, not only in the mouths of apostles and those that would follow after him in preaching and teaching, 
But we thank you, Father, also for your word in print that you would preserve for us by your Holy Spirit. We thank, that, we thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit is still active in proclaiming that message to us all and encouraging those of us in your family with it. We pray, Father, that our repentance would be real and that we would be ever conscious of working that out. We pray, Father, that you would uh, increase your Holy Spirit's work in our lives uh, to where we would continually sort through who we are and position to you. But we thank you, Father, and we ask that you will always keep in the forefront of our minds the love, the mercy, and the grace that you give to us through the work of your Son on our behalf. Comfort us in that. And to your glory and in Jesus' name, amen.